All right, so this is uh, Ted Gortney, and I want to welcome you to the Council of Georgia's Organization's annual Friendship Gathering. And um, I'm going to be introducing Wynn in just a second, but first I wanted to mention that there are two people that wanted, would like to have been here that weren't able to make it and asked to be recognized. Uh, the first one was uh, Fred Harrison, um, who of course is in London, but let me just read what he, uh, what he said. I regret that I cannot join the Zoom meeting tomorrow, but I appreciate someone conveying on my half, behalf my deepest um, regards, expression of sadness at the passing of our colleagues. I have a heavy, heavily relied on my colleagues for the work I've undertaken. I miss the presence in what will necessar necessarily be the final phase of my work on behalf of the Georgia's cause. The accumulated knowledge and wisdom of people like Fred, Walt, Harry, who dedicated a large slice, slice of their lives to the pursuit of justice that we may, that we will miss them all. Their, their passing emphasizes to, for us, the old timers that we need to convey that knowledge uh, to the next generation. That's from Fred Harrison. The second uh, person who uh, asked uh, that they be recognized was Rick DeMar, uh, who had a prior commitment. And he's sending his deepest respect to those who kept the Georgia's tradition alive over the years. At this point, I would like to introduce our, um, our um, our hostess, our uh, mistress of ceremony, as we're calling her, Wynne Achenbaum. Uh, Wynne is the treasurer of the Robert Schachenbach Foundation. And she comes from a late blooming, as a late blooming grandchild of three Georges. I knew her grandfather, Weld Carter, very well. Uh, Weld uh, uh, produced the 10 Tread series books on resources and economic development that uh, were used by Georges in the, uh, in the 60s. And uh, so that's, that's her grandfather. And Wynne is known for her websites, so, um, Wealth and Want, uh, the singletax.com, and What Would Jesus Tax. So Wynne, um, uh, it's turned over to you to, uh, to talk about and to eulogize our uh, departed members. Okay. I, I won't take up a lot of time. Um, I, I've been looking forward to this event uh, and this chance to, chance to see all your faces because I, I, I miss the the face to face contact we have each year at CGO. Um, but we're, we're remembering four people we've lost in the past year. It's been a tough year. Mason Gaffney died a year ago Friday. It seems ages ago now. Um, we lost Harry in November. Paul Justice in January, Walt in May, and Fred in June. Each of them were people we saw with some regularity at CGO conferences. For me, the, the, those conferences always felt like a reunion of cousins, not blood relatives, but of people of like spirit. And I look forward to that. My, my life has been enriched by knowing each of them. Uh, I'd like, like to start uh, with Fred, Fred Fulberry. Nick, uh, uh, and I'm not seeing faces right now. I'm not seeing Nick's, Nick's face. Is, is he here? Oh, he's not, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back later. <laughs> um, Rick, ride back. Are you here? Yes, I see you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, is it all right if I share my screen at this time? Absolutely. Yes. So I hope people are seeing a slideshow. Is that, are people seeing slides? Yeah, we're, we're, seeing, see, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of small pictures. Thumbnails. Hello. You see, we're seeing thumbnails. Oh, you only see thumbnails? Right. Uh, yes. Okay, I have to yes. stop the share and start it again.
Is yeah. that better? No, it's working. Yes. Okay. So uh, let me just, uh, these are our pictures that will scroll of dad while I talk a little bit about him. Dad saw goodness and God in almost everybody. And by caring about other people and listening to them with genuine interest and respect, friends became, I mean, strangers became friends and friends became family. Dad put the interests of other people above his own. For dad, this did not involve sacrifice because dad could see himself in others. And he believed that other people's interests were very much his own. Dad grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia during the Depression. His parents were from New York City, and their parents had immigrated to New York from Europe in the late 1800s. Dad's parents were optimistic, compassionate, and charismatic. Dad had an older brother, Art, who you see on the left in that photo, who was also charismatic and a mischief maker who played tricks on his teachers. He was dad's hero. Art later became a dentist in Wheeling and he would care for our teeth. You're probably noticing in the slideshow that Art and dad look a lot alike. One day after leaving Art's dental office, mom and dad realized that they needed a gift. So they entered a candy store across the street in downtown Wheeling. The woman behind the counter looked up and said, Dr. Rybeck, I never thought I'd see you in here. And then she noticed my mother on Dr. Rybeck's arm, and that was not Dr. Rybeck's wife. So the woman behind the counter became very flustered, and I'm sure it made for very interesting gossip in Wheeling that weekend. When Dad was growing up, Wheeling and Pittsburgh were rival steel cities and centers for both industry and culture. In the late 1920s, a Colonel Ogilby donated his vast estate to the city of Wheeling. The Wheeling government saw this donation as a huge liability and burden. The estate was outside the city limits and only rich people with cars could get to it. So the government was inclined to sell it off. But my dad's parents and a few other families thought that this estate could be beneficial to Wheeling. They volunteered to create picnic areas, nature trails, and programs. Dad and his family were among the first to camp there, attend nature programs, and folk dance camps. The involvement of the Rybeck family, the Good family, and others helped instill in my father a love of nature, and it also taught him valuable leadership skills. Dad had an easy, low-key low way of engaging strangers. And he also played piano well, and he offered concerts when he started his college career, studying journalism at West Virginia University in Morgantown. World War II interrupted Dad's college. He was deployed to France, arriving there just as the war in Europe ended. Dad was stationed in Epernay, a small town northeast of Paris. Displaced persons were just beginning to return. Somebody in dad's engineering unit asked permission to clean up the local synagogue that had been trashed by the Nazis. Permission was granted, the synagogue was cleaned up, and a service was held to rededicate it. To dad's amazement, the local Jews invited American soldiers to their homes after the service. Here were people returning to find out that their family members had been killed or that their property had been stolen by neighbors and yet they were offering hospitality to these foreign soldiers. Dad became lifelong friends with the couple that invited him to dinner, Gabby and Gaston Hanno. After the war, Dad resumed his studies, majoring in economics and political science at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Antioch had a work study program that appealed to Dad. He would get a job working at a news service and then return for coursework. He continued to play piano and was informed that an aspiring singer needed an accompanist. And that's how dad met Corinna Scott. She was a talented and beautiful woman 
and she was invited to sing at black churches in Ohio. Dad accompanied her to her singing engagements. On one occasion, Dad brought Coretta to Wheeling, West Virginia to meet his parents. They decided to meet at the 12th Street Grill in downtown Wheeling. When they arrived, the manager said that Coretta would have to eat in the kitchen. My grandfather, Walt's father, said that this was unacceptable, and they left. They called up to Ogilvy Park, where a folk dance camp was underway. Was dinner still available? Well, as it turns out, dinner was over and had been put away, but the Rybex and Miss Scott would be welcome to come up and eat. So Dad and Coretta and his parents went up to Ogilvy Park, where they ate in the camp kitchen while the others danced. Because of their different backgrounds, Dad and Coretta experienced this event very differently. Dad felt that it was a triumph of conscience by refusing to give in to the demands of the 12th Street Grill. Coretta, as she wrote in her autobiography, noted that she ended up eating in the kitchen and therefore felt she was not accepted as an equal. Dad and Coretta may have had other misunderstandings as well. Apparently, they discussed the issue of how to raise children in an interracial family. Dad thought that this was an interesting philosophical discussion. Coretta may have felt that it was more personal. Although they stopped seeing each other after dad graduated from Antioch, they continued to stay in touch. And my parents later visited her in Montgomery, Alabama. After college, dad took a trip to the Galapagos Islands. Well, actually he took a trip. He intended to take a year to go all around South America and study uh, political economy there. Uh, when he was in Ecuador, he heard about the Galapagos Island and a Navy mail boat that went out uh, once every few weeks. So he took the Navy boat out to the Galapagos Island, and the boat didn't come back for three months. Dad had a wonderful time in the Galapagos with the few pioneering families who were there, and it's one of the highlights of his life. After his return, Dad worked briefly for a newspaper in Columbus, Ohio. Then he got a job with the Dayton Daily News. While in Dayton, Dad made, met Erica Schulhoff. Mom was an elementary school teacher who was about to leave for a new job in California. They liked each other, but assumed that they would spend only a short time together before Mom departed to the West Coast. But as it turns out, Dad was a Jewish guy who had just had a rough breakup with a Catholic girlfriend. And mom was a Catholic girl who had just had a rough breakup <laughs> with a Jewish boyfriend. When it was time for mom to leave, they realized that they really cared for each other. And dad inquired, how does Mrs. Rybeck sound to you? And that was his proposal. Mom and dad's love for each other, for us kids and for their extended family and friends has been the primary source of nutrition for my life. My childhood was amazing. Mom and dad taught us to appreciate nature, music, learning, and other people. As a family, we pulled crabgrass, planted flowers, mowed the lawn, cleaned the house. We would visit my mom's aunt and uncle in Yellow Springs, Ohio. My mother's aunt was very stern, but very loving. She also had two ovens, which I thought was amazing. And they always contained wonderful food of European origin. We took magical trips to Wheeling, West Virginia, where we spent that time with dad's parents, with dad's brother, Art, Art's wife, Sivia, and their five kids, Chick, Dan, Blanche, Abe, and Ted. We were also introduced to our aunts and uncles in the Good family and the Wishnu family. As a college student, I learned that I wasn't actually related to Uncle Larry Good, and I informed him of my discovery. Uncle Larry responded, he said, well, we're not relatives, we're lovatives. And mom and dad have adopted many lovatives into their family. And many of you are on this Zoom meeting tonight. Uh, speaking of, well, I'm gonna skip this next uh, passage, but uh, dad loved parties for which there was a theme or activity. Many times in June, dad would harvest the elderberry blossoms, 
placing them in large buckets. Guests would arrive at our home and inquire, what are we going to eat? And dad would point at the elderberry blossoms in the bucket. Then he would strip off the foliage, hold the elderberry blossom by the stem, dip it in pancake butter, and then dip the coated blossom into hot oil where it would fry up into a waffle. We would then drizzle syrup over it and eat the blossoms as they dangled from their stems. At parties, dad always set aside get time for guests to introduce themselves. Sometimes he would ask them to sing a song or demonstrate a dance or lead an activity. For mom and dad's 65th wedding anniversary, dad invited about 70 people. Now, dad wanted to assign guests to specific seats, but name tags seemed a bit too mundane. So instead, he wrote a four to eight line poem for each guest. As people arrived, they wandered among the tables, reading the poems at each place. If the poem was about them, then that was their assigned seat. I asked dad how long it took him to compose these poems. Oh, about two weeks, he said nonchalantly. As many of you know, dad wrote a book that was published in 2011. It mixes autobiography with dad's ideas for social and economic justice. Recently, Dad was writing another book. Now, Dad was not one to complain, but over the past year, Dad confided his unhappiness that a benign tumor on the lining of his brain was inhibiting his ability to write. I have discovered Dad's manuscript. It's a very long work about economic justice. It's in the form of a conversation between Dad and three spirits. In that way, I suppose it's a little bit like Dickens' Christmas Carol, but more like Shakespeare, all the conversations are written in verse. Dad's sharp intellect and communication skills, combined with his kind, generous, and optimistic spirit, have helped the Georgist movement expand beyond a few intellectuals and reach a broader audience, particularly among the younger generation and activists. Some may wonder about dad's pursuit of the lost cause for land reform in the US, but dad has seen lost causes won. He started an interracial symphony in Fairmont, West Virginia during the 1940s. He saved a natural history museum in Dayton, Ohio in the 1950s. He also saw the civil rights, the women's rights, and the environmental movements make significant gains after years of struggle by people who had little political or economic clout. These two were lost causes until people demanded change. Dad wasn't perfect, but he was about as close to perfect as you can get. He inspired me, he coached me, he loved me and celebrated me. I'm very lucky that I got to spend so much time with him, but I'm selfish and I wanted more. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Do others have memories they want to share? Let, let me begin by just making a toast um, uh, to Walt Ryback. And please join me. You're here. Now we can hear from others who like to express remarks. I think it was Walt's just gentleness of spirit that, that drew me to him. It was a lot of wisdom, but the, the gentleness of, of, of that man and, and sweetness. And, and I, I think describe, when I describe someone as a sweet man, I, that's about the highest praise I can give. And he, he certainly fit, fit that category. Can you tell us a bit about his work with the uh, the urban urban commission or Douglas Commission? Well, Dad was a, a newspaper reporter, um, and uh, he was an editor at the Dayton Daily News, which was owned by the Cox newspaper chain. And in 1960 or thereabouts, the Cox newspaper changed 
chain needed a bureau chief in Washington, D.C. So dad thought what he was thought he was taking a promotion by coming here because there was an increase in pay. But the price of housing and groceries was so much more expensive here, it ended up being like, like a pay cut. But he ended up here in Washington, D.C. And in 1967, he joined uh, the National Commission on Urban Problems as a assistant director. Uh, the National Commission for Urban Problems was headed by former Senator Paul Douglas. And Senator Douglas had an affinity for Henry George and uh, gave dad a portrait of Henry George to hang above his desk. And dad uh, helped the commission edit its findings. And uh, those uh, findings were published in a book, I think in 1969. So dad worked for the commission for two, two or three years, 1967, 1968, 1969. And then the commission itself was dissolved and he went to work for the Urban Institute where he edited other people's scholarly works so that it would be intelligible to uh, non-academics. Uh, Can you explain the Douglas Commission to those who may not be familiar with it? Well, as many of you know, there were a lot of riots uh, during the mid 60s. And so uh, President Johnson appointed this commission to try to figure out what was wrong with cities, what what was going on that was wrong and what could be done to correct it. So the commission held hearings all around the country. Uh, they talked to government leaders, they talked to community activists and tried to figure out what was wrong and what could go better. Uh, the findings were published and uh, surprisingly, uh, property tax reform is highlighted as one of the important tools that could be used to make cities work better and to thwart urban sprawl and to promote vital city centers. But as with many commissions, uh, it, the report sits on a shelf and gathers dust. Tell us about is it the Center for Public Dialogue. So after the uh, Douglas Commission dissolved. Dad went to work for the Urban Institute, where he was an editor there for several years. Then he worked for Congressman Henry Royce from Wisconsin. Uh, Congressman Royce was on the Banking Committee, and then he also worked for William Coyne after that. But during those years, he also started his own consultancy, which he called the Center for Public Dialogue. And he took on clients and did work primarily related to property tax reform. Uh, some of the interesting things that I remember was that early on, there was a county in West Virginia that they wanted to build a new school for their kids. And so they wanted to float a bond and they were not allowed to float a bond because the, the bond underwriter said there wasn't enough assessed value in the county to support the bond issue. And a lot of people were kind of amazed because the county was full of coal. And so it had to be very valuable. How was it possible that there wasn't enough assessed value to support the bond issue? So they hired my dad to investigate. My dad went to the county assessor and said, where do you get the value for the coal under your county? And the assessor said, well, we get it from the coal company. So my dad went to the coal company and he found the uh, person at the coal company who was in charge of the assessments and found out that the value for the coal in the county had stayed pretty much the same since the 1920s. Now we're talking, I think this, we're now either in either the late 60s or early 1970s. And when my dad was talking to the coal company assessor about this, he said, well, it's interesting that you're asking about this. I don't think anybody had ever talked to him about it before. He said, here in the company, we're kind of split about what we should be doing with these assessments. Some people in the company think we should give the 1920 values because those values are really low. And so we can just sit on the coal while it goes up in value and you know, make money by keeping the coal in the ground. But there are others in the company who think we should state what the market value is 
And these people think we should do that because that would force us to mine the coal and put people to work and get the coal out of the ground. So the coal, the company had a kind of split personality. Now, as it turns out, the speculator side tend to carry the day. And so they, but that was one of the first projects my dad worked on with the Center for Public Dialogue. There were other projects as well for Shock and Back and others. He produced a film called A Tale of Five Cities about Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, Scranton, McKeesport, and a few others. And uh, I, I think that gives you a little flavor of what he did. Thank you. And uh, I understand Ed, Ed wants to speak. And I'm not seeing, seeing Ed on here. But... Now oh, you there see you are. Me. Now I see you. Yeah, I um, just listening to Rick talk, it just brings back some memories. You know, Walt was always very generous with me as I was a younger, uh, you know, person coming into the Georges community. Uh, he, he and I co-wrote a paper uh, somewhere along the lines. I can't remember. I think it was on affordable housing, but I don't remember exactly. Uh, but uh, when I retired from Fannie Mae, uh, maybe a year or two after that, um, I arranged to for a meeting with um, uh, Senator Paul Kanjorski, who represented Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I called Walt and asked him if he would be willing to come into Washington uh, to uh, Senator Kanjorski's office with me. And we went in and we gave them gave him a real pitch. Uh, Walt did most of the talking, to tell you the truth. And and I thought we really had Kanjorski. Um, lined up to, su to support uh, LVT, but um, politicians often say they're going to do things and don't do them. But, um, but I, I just have really a lot of really fond memories of interaction with Walt over the, you know, the decades that I came to know him. And, he, and Rick, you had a great father and I considered him a friend. Thank you, Ed. Uh your, your talk about the politicians not doing what they say. If dad had a fault, it was that perhaps at least early on, he was a little politically naive. I remember several occasions when he would come back after talking to a politician, he'd be very excited because at the end of the meeting, the politician said, well, that's very interesting. We should look into that. And dad thought, wow, they're really going to do something, not realizing that this was kind of a, a brush off line just to get you to leave the office. But uh, I think he wised up in later years. Steve Cord used to say that the best, the number one talent of a politician is the ability to make no sound like yes. Yeah. Tell us about the, the uh, and I'm, I'm going to garble the, the name, but the Mountain Men, the West Virginia Mountain Men. I have fond memories of, of Carl Shaw and your uncle and your father sitting together. And I think your aunt also at some of the CGO meetings. So I think you're talking about a group called MUST, yes. M-U-S-T, Mountaineers That's... for Sane Taxation, I think was what the acronym stood for. I could be wrong about that. But my uncle, Art, dad's older brother, was a dentist, but he had a broad issue interest in philosophical issues and other things. And as he was getting later into his career, he really got interested in the Henry George tax reform and vigorously tried to push it in West Virginia. And I think some of my dad's best times were working with Art, this fellow Car Carl Shaw and others as they tried to get people at the West Virginia legislature to be interested. And there was a West Virginia congressman whose name I'm forgetting was it Schechter? I don't know. I'm 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 blanking on his name. Who was who was interesting because he was a very progressive politician in a state that typically sent sort of coal company and timber company cronies to Washington, and yet he survived in Congress as a progressive for a long time, and he was very encouraging, but. Um, yeah, Dad loved working for, for Must, but they uh, they were unable to get the legislation through the state legislature. Okay, 
I know Walt joined the Schockenbach board in 1959 and, and served off and on over the course of, of many decades. Uh, I know there was one situation where whoever his boss was uh, in, in DC uh, required everybody to resign from any such affiliations. But then he was back and, and around 2000 uh, led a group writing a report, uh, advisory report to Schockenbach. Uh, he, he was a, a major presence. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Paul Justice, could 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 we could we have that presentation? Uh, Tom Gearing and Jeff Strang, I understand, will be presenting. I, I saw Tom's face. Yes, there. believe uh, Jeff is here. Jeff, are you here? No, he couldn't make it. Uh, so my uh, my comments will be very brief, uh, simply because we didn't really have that much um, contact with Paul. Paul lives in Salem, and of course we are based in Portland. And it wasn't very often that we we saw Paul very seldom, but he joined our meetings every month and was um, always Paul Paul was always very helpful. He would never shirk from responsibility. The only time that I really got to know Paul um, was during the uh, conference in 19 or in 2019 at, uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, Paul um, came to my house to stay overnight for the flight from Portland to Pittsburgh. He brought all his equipment with him because he was going to be recording that conference. And you'll remember that that's what he did during the entire conference stood behind that camera. We had quite a bit of equipment, but we shared the flight, a good time on the flight all the way to uh, Pittsburgh. Um, we, um, in Pittsburgh, we uh, saw Paul every day. And um, I would say, let's see, the last time that I actually probably saw Paul in person was the day that we left Pittsburgh. Can I share this one photo, if you don't mind? By all means. Yeah. Oh, where are we here? Paul on the right. I see Nate Blair. Yeah, you can see Paul. Whoops. There. Whoop. There he is. Yeah, we went to a pub uh, uh, just before we uh, took the flight back, and on in, with us there was uh, Nate Blair, Nellie Devere, and Paul, and myself. We had a beer before we left. Paul would, the thing I remembered about Paul during that conference, most of all, is that you might recall that he had um, a, a really serious uh, foot problem because mm -hmm. of uh, what's his, what's the problem he had? It was, uh, well, you know that he, he, he had a very hard time walking. He had diabetes. He had what? He had diabetes. Yes, he had, a, he had diabetes. Diabetes, and uh, but uh, he wouldn't complain ever complain. So once in a while we would go out for a coffee or go for a beer, or just just down the block, and uh, we we Paul was just very kind. He was very helpful, and of course you'll know that he was our um, web master for our particular chapter, and would always um, put up whatever we wanted on our website, and you take care of that for us. 
but he joined our meetings every month and um, without fail, he, he just did whatever he was asked to do and um, just never, never failed us. So that I wish that uh, there were an opportunity to know Paul better and see him more often. But uh, being that we were in Portland and we didn't get to Salem, except during the session when the legislature was in session, but we really didn't see Paul during those visits with our legislators. But we communicated with him on our telephone calls during our meetings. And well, that's pretty much it. Some, I'm sure some of you know Paul better than maybe um, Chris or Jeff and I, and some of us in Portland know Paul, but we just, whatever um, contact we had with Paul, it was always pleasant, always agreeable. Can anyone tell us about his, his fictional book? Uh, he he did, did something very interesting and I, I wish I had my copy at hand. So Mark has a copy in Mark front of does. him. That's good. Mark, yes. did you want to say something about the book? Mark? Well, <laughs> it's, it was a real pioneering effort to write something uh, to convey the, the George's message to a young, okay. uh, very young audience. It's a children's book. Um, he took the initiative to get it self published. Um, which also says a lot. I know Paul felt it could be uh, even improved, um, but I'm no expert in children's books. Um, but I know we had it at, at at least several CGO conferences, or at least one or two before um, uh, the pandemic. And I don't know whether RSF still distributes it, um, I know uh, we did when I was working for RSF, but I'm sure it's on Amazon. Although since Paul has passed on, I have no idea who's the custodian of the book to keep it in print. It was print on demand, I think. Um, although Paul did give us uh, about 20 copies originally. Thank you. You can see it's an economic fairy tale, self-described. And of course, George is the saint that slays the dragon. Um, so he, he played up on that connection. Yeah. Well, Paul spent most of his career in, in Northwest uh, Arkansas, as I understand it, That's right. uh, as a, a, an urban planner. Mm -hmm. And in, in uh, I think, late, Late 2014, early 2015, he and, and Andrea moved moved to Oregon uh, because of her, her illness. She she died in October 2015. Uh, but he seemed very very content to be to stay in in, in Oregon, uh, despite his roots in, in uh, Arkansas and I think before that Kansas. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the thing, I mean, what Tom says is very much how I saw him too. Nobody, nobody at CGO um, did more and, and, and drew less attention to himself than Paul. And he just, he just like quietly did, did videos for all the conferences. Um, I didn't know until after he was gone how much work there is in taking the video and preparing it to um, be uploadable on, on YouTube. And, um, I never heard much, you know, much from him about, you know, I never heard his opinions on George very much or anything. He just quietly like did what he could do to help. Um, uh, now in, um, I forget what year it was, but it was shortly before he moved from Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Um, Alana and I were driving to a West Coast conference, and um, and he hosted us there. And 
I'll tell you what, Eureka Springs is the most fascinating town I've ever seen in my life. Um, it is, it, they, they call it the hole in the Bible belt. And it was just, um, I don't know if people remember the Snuffy Smith cartoons where, where, you know, you see Snuffy Smith and there was mountain after mountain behind him, And, and everywhere you went, you, you were on this narrow thing. Well, Eureka Springs is these really narrow roads that have, um, you know, there's a, there's a hotel in Eureka Springs where the, 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 the front of the road is, is on the ground floor or the, the ground floor is on a road in front of it and the fourth floor is on the road behind it. And, um, and for those first four floors, uh, it was a seven story hotel, but for the first four, four, store, floor, four floors, there was, there was a balcony on each side going out into the ground and, and uh, there, were, there were lots of springs and, and it was all arts and crafts people. And I, it looked like, it looked like, um, looked like free enterprise capitalism meets a hippie commune because the whole place was just, and he and, he and his wife just loved taking us around and seeing all of Eureka Springs. And um, even then, I don't remember him like wanting to talk to us about Georgism and stuff. I he probably thought we understood it well enough. And and uh, and that was just his way. He he was like he seemed to be like not particularly opinionated and overwhelmingly helpful. And that's the way he was for all the CGO conferences as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. <clears throat> well, I also had um, yeah. what might be called the spiritual side. I remember having one long discussion with him, and I don't remember all the details. It was sort of very liberal, open minded, um, um, sort of nature oriented spirituality. But he's strikes me as a person, maybe because he was reserved, did not announce his presence at every, every encounter, got a lot done. He was more a doer than a, a talker. And um, I don't know, I say that with a, with a bit of humility, which you cannot say without presumption. So um, I really treasured Paul as someone who did what was needed. And I'll leave it at that. And, and I certainly miss him. Sue, so, oh, you're muted. Huh? Here. Um, what I remember about Paul was, as the others, very quiet, very unassuming, but he would do anything. Um, I remember his, him ta taking bus trips with um, another person from Missouri okay, and how they would go Greyhound, 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 and they didn't mind it. Uh, Paul helped us in um, Cleveland. He helped us in Kansas City where he had relatives. I wish I could connect with his cousin Maria, who was on the north side of KAC. Okay. But when we were proofing the bus tour for Kansas City, he was the one guy who we could go to who understood George enough that what my husband Scott was going to present about Kansas City would fit in. And he would add things. Um, he was a graduate of KU, as they call it there, Kansas, University of Kansas. And, or he went, he got his master's. His undergrad was from um, the, it was sent from St. Louis University. And um, you know, just a really nice guy. And definitely um, Scott and I will have missed him terribly. It was very much a shock in January when we tried to reach him for a common ground call and he didn't pick up his phone. And we kept trying and 
I'm the one who called Tom um, to find out, have you heard from him? And the uh, people from the Oregon chapter actually called and did a wellness check. And that's how we found he had died. So thank you. Well, um, I, I guess this isn't really important, but I remember asking him uh, about the intended audience for young George and the dragon. Uh, he pointed out that the uh, average adult in this country reads at an eighth grade level or whatever the uh, <laughs> number was. So, well, and, uh, and uh, I, again, I do remember him uh, operating the video equipment and all that. Um, I have to endorse what was said about him as, as someone who was quiet and unassuming and just did the job. Okay. Yeah. Gwen? Okay, go ahead. Bill? Yeah, um, I first got to know Paul because we're both former Peace Corps volunteers. That's right. And of course, I know there's other Peace Corps volunteers among us here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, Paul was sent to a small island in, the, in Micronesia, Tonga. And he was asked to be uh, a statistician. Now, I don't know what kind of stati statistics uh, Tonga really needed. But um, Paul uh, took on that responsibility and had a very good two years in yeah. Tonga. That's right. Yep. Okay. Well, yep. uh, uh, what, shall we toast, toast Paul's yeah. memory? Yeah. Right Another of the people that I, I really just miss seeing. To Paul. Yeah. To Paul. To Paul. Uh -oh. Paul. Ed? Hello. Would you like yes. me to talk about our, our colleague, Harry? Please. Yeah. Um, what can I say about Harry Pollard? Uh, Harry Pollard was never in the background quite, uh, not as long as I knew him. And I, I can't remember exactly when the first time I actually met him in person, but I had heard a lot about him even probably a year or two before I actually met him. Well, uh, I don't know if all of you know his basic story, but uh, he definitely wasn't born in the United States. Uh, he had an East Coast accent, but it was an East Coast of Britain. Uh, Harry was born in London uh, or in, in the area. I don't know exactly if he was in, born in London, 1923, and he was very much involved in uh, radical politics, liberal politics in England. Uh, did a lot of um, corner, uh, what, I don't know what the, the exact term for it is in, in England, but, but uh, um, went, went into the public arena where he got onto the uh, steps and, and gave speeches and talked about uh, the things he believed in. Um, he, Somewhere along the line, uh, ran into uh, single taxers and became, you know, just deeply engrossed in Henry George's ideas and, and attended the uh, Henry George School in, in England and taught there for a while before uh, he decided that, that uh, for basically advancement reasons, he would leave England. And in, in 1954, he came to Canada not directly to the United States. And he, he got very much involved with the, the Georges and single taxers in Toronto, um, taught, taught Henry George classes there and uh, uh, started to attend the Georges conferences in the United States. Uh, I think the first one, I, I remember him, his record uh, being about 1955 when he attended the conference and in Berea, Ohio, at Baldwin Wallace College, 
uh, maybe one or two of you remember that one. I don't know if since Walt's no longer with us, I don't know if anyone goes back quite that far anymore. But uh, he was always giving talks. He was writing consistently. Um, and in 1957, he became the director of the Henry George School in Toronto. Um, well, I don't know exactly when he got the idea that he ought to migrate to California, but um, he, he first made a couple pit stops. He actually served as a volunteer director of the Henry George School in Pittsburgh for a short while in 1961. And then uh, finally, later that year, was invited to come out to California to uh, take over the Southern California Henry George School from William Trueheart. Uh, and, and Bob Andelson was also director at the time. And I guess Bob was, was, was taking a permanent faculty position uh, at, the, at the University at Auburn. I'm not sure about that, but that's my, my sense of things. So Henry, I mean, uh, so Harry uh, packed up his bags and, and his family and moved to Southern California. Um, and he was, you know, began teaching classes, of course, and he was never satisfied uh, with how the, how the classes were taught. The, the, the program that was developed as a Socratic program by Oscar Geiger and others was, was constantly being refined over the years. But Harry, Harry found that not to be uh, particularly effective in inculcating people with the deepest vision of Henry George. And so he, he began to work on a whole new approach over the years of, of how to, how to uh, teach political economy. And so he came up with the term classical analysis, uh, which he began to use with, adult, with adults. And um, when, I, when I first learned of Harry, I had been on the board of the Henry George School in New York for maybe a year or two. And we would get these reports from, from Harry uh, about all the outreach and success he was having, you know, the, the many, many people that, that have gone through the classes. And, and Harry's objective in, in, in this classroom teaching was to turn students into teachers. So he had a whole uh, program that would uh, get people to take a year's program with him and then gradually kind of press them, give them confidence that they could take over a class and then start teaching themselves. And so his, his basic idea of how do you create Georgia's was you take students and you turn them into teachers. Because I think all of us who have taught know that you, in order to teach effectively, you have to immerse yourself into the material. Um, you really have to learn it well. And you have, to, you have to know how to take tough questions. You have to be able to answer tough questions that people bring to you who come to the classes with very different political or economic perspectives. And, and Harry was always working to try to do that. Um, and the 1973 uh, Georgia's conference, actually this was the, um, the International Union Conference at the Isle of Man, he presented his ideas, which he called classical analysis of political economy. This is 1973. And, uh, and he tried to get others within the Henry George School community to take a look at this and try to teach it. To my knowledge, the only person who ever did that was Mark Sullivan. And maybe I'll stop for a moment and let Mark remember if he does what his experience was trying to uh, use Harry's material to teach Henry George. Well, you're talking about it got me thinking about it. And in the 80s, uh, one of my uh, jobs was to teach courses, uh, classes at Henry George School in New York. And I did, uh, one of the courses that I did teach was classical analysis. And I'll say just a, a few things that I appreciated. 
Um, one, it was material um, openly written by Harry Pollard. So, um, if I disagreed with it, I was disagreeing with Harry, not with Henry George, number one. So that gave me a little bit more freedom as a teacher. Two, it was in sort of dialogue format. Um, students, the material would be statements with um, blanks to fill in, et cetera. And that did engage the students. It was a bit, it was, it was a, an attempt at being interactive um, before that became, I think, a really big thing. Um, I remember a few points that Harry made that um, stick in my mind. One is comparing uh, land and collectibles um, and describing why land values don't go down because like a collectible, you can't make more of it. Um, his definition of rent as the sum of the advantages minus the, minus the sum of the disadvantages. People seem to get that. Um, and also his analogy of the hotel as an analogy for a community where the public infrastructure such as the um, elevators, you don't pay for every time you get on an elevator. It's paid for out of your room rent. And um, I thought it was a very good um, teaching platform. Um, and I was friends with Harry. We, we, we bickered on certain things. Um, I thought it was kind of silly to say, well, the rent collected should be just, could be, could be just thrown in the sea. Um, that seemed a little wasteful. Um, so I, I did have an early friendship with him and that may have been partly um, fed by using his materials. And um, I don't know where they are now. Um, no, I, I'll tell you where some of them are. I have them online. Yeah. Uh, on the SCI uh, website. Uh, a couple of people have asked for a photograph of Harry, which I'm gonna try to pull up. Am I, am I, do I have screen sharing capability already? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can find a picture of Harry. Well, while you're looking, I just wanted to point out that uh, Harry was the most delightfully disagreeable person in the movement. <laughs> in other words, Harry, Harry had a way of, um, of making everything funny. And so even, even if he had a serious disagreement with you, he, he, uh, he would express it in such a humorous or good and good natured way that you, you had to, uh, laugh about it and then when you disagreed back you were being so much more serious than he was it was like mm -hmm. a, an extreme talent that i think is is uniquely british and um and he was he was excellent at that are you seeing harry on your screen yeah, yeah. i say that seems to be his favorite shirt <laughs> <laughs> I, well I can't uh, imagine him without that shirt. Now, here's here's where the story of, of Harry's education work. It gets a little bit interesting, and and you can understand the context when I when I go through this. In 1979, uh, the annual conference was in San Francisco to celebrate the centenary centenary of Henry George. So at that conference, Harry delivers a paper titled. Our first 150,000, the Interstitute high, high School Program. And, and so at this, he was basically saying to, to all the Georges there that since I have been working with high school teachers to teach this system of political economy, he didn't call it classical analysis for the, for the high schools, they, they called it interstudent. And, and the reason he named it interstudent was because the teacher 
uh, had a very minor role in the classroom. The students basically ran the show and uh, they competed with one another in groups. Um, uh, he even, and, and Brett Barker was, was one of his teachers and he had a whole group of teachers who were teaching the inter-student program. They basically uh, told the students they could cheat. And because they, they, the students were allowed to cheat and they were competing with one another, um, they didn't cheat. And, and so he had a lot of uh, you know, human psychology into how he structured this program. And uh, well, anyway, a, a lot of people thought, well, okay, you've been teaching, you've been, you've been teaching adults using this classical analysis program. You say these thousands and thousands of people went through this program and 150,000 kids went through high school and many of them are graduated, graduated in college. Where are they? <laughs> They're not here at the Henry George conference. And, and, and so, I mean, that's the challenge. It, that's a challenge for, for all of us who had this experience of teaching in the classroom, uh, you know, for years and years, people come, they take the course, they enjoy it. Uh, they may even get it, but they don't become involved with us. So that, that was part of the challenge. Harry was, was suggesting, I have a much better way of reaching people. And his raw numbers seem to suggest that, but faced with the same kind of challenges as the rest of us had who were teaching. So uh, I joined the, the board. I, well, I started teaching Henry George at the Philadelphia uh, Extension in 1981 after spending a year taking his program, started to go to the annual conferences and met Harry at one of these, these conferences, listened to him talk, talked to him about his approach uh, because as I began teaching, one, one of the, my problems that I had, and maybe others of you have taught, found this, uh, my students wouldn't read or didn't read consistently. And asking them to do homework, you know, coming back to class next week with questions answered to, to have a Socratic discussion was, turned out to be impossible. And so uh, I had to abandon the basic Socratic method. Well, Harry had dealt with that, as, as Mark explained, in his approach to, to teaching and, and to, to how learning was going to, to take place. People really didn't have to, as I, and Mark maybe support me on this, didn't have to go and read assignments ahead of class. Um, but, but still, he, he made it very interactive. So uh, the, the real problem, the real challenge was as Harry was communicating his results to the board of trustees in New York, people were saying, really, Harry, you know, I mean, are you really, you know, giving us a, a you know, a line? And, and Harry wasn't, but when I had conversations about all this with Harry, my, my comment to him was, Harry, we're in a no-win situation with the classroom education. You're competing now with community colleges and low cost uh, state colleges. You know, whereas in the, in the late 30s and the 1940s, there wasn't much opportunity for very low cost higher education or intellectual you know, uh, stimulation. But now it's, it's the era of the late 60s and the 70s and 80s. And what do people want out of education? They want skills for jobs and they want credentials for employment. And what do we have to offer? We don't have a competing you know, program to, to offer. So that was a conversation that Harry and I had on numerous occasions, but uh, I wish Brett Barker was here on the call because Brett stuck with him, stuck with inter-student uh, for the entire 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. And Brett has just retired from teaching. So he is the, he's probably inherited, he inherited Harry's commitment to this program and refined it. And, uh, and I don't know what, 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 how Brett feels about the lasting impact on his students, but he proved that Harry's inventiveness, his approach to teaching Henry George was extremely effective 
and deserves uh, some reconsideration about how we might resurrect it. Um, I miss Harry. Uh, when I, one year uh, on business, I went, I had to go to a management uh, retreat in, in Marina Del Rey. Uh, and Harry came in to, to have a beer or two with me in uh, Pasadena. And Brett came with them. And we had, we had, a lot of conversations about the status of the Georgia's movement about the school and education and personalities and everything else. And so I, I would say, uh, I learned a great deal from Harry. I always, uh, from the, almost the first I met him, I considered him a friend and I certainly sorely miss his, uh, robust enthusiasm and his insight, intellect and, and his wit. And so with that, I'll let others share your experiences of, of knowing and, and uh, being with Harry over all the years. I just want to add a note of appreciation for Harry's use of the term classical. And then I was, he was attempting, I think, accurately to uh, put Georgia's political economy within the context of classical political economy. And I think that was a, a worthy attempt. And I think it was quite accurate. And as we know, we Georgians have endless discussions about why we should not call ourselves Georgists. Um, classical political economy, uh, has been abandoned and we are partly at least um, waving the banner and keeping the torch flying for classical political economy. And um, a word to our departed Lindy Davies attempting to update it and upgrade it to handle 21st century um, issues and Maybe there's a way to keep uh, to piggyback on this work that Harry um, started. Can I break in here. Uh, you remind me, Mark, of the characterization of Georgism by philosophers. Uh, philosophers, uh, many of them, are aware of a, uh, a perspective that they call left libertarianism. And the two fundamental assumptions of left libertarianism are that people have rights to themselves and all people have equal rights to the earth. Now, what could be uh, a closer description of Henry George? So when I'm talking to academics, I often say that I'm a left libertarian. And many of them know what I mean by that. <clears throat> here, here. Now, uh, I remember Fred's, oh, uh, Alana, go ahead. Oh, to me? Yes. Okay, I guess uh, uh, Ed mentioned the uh, Henry George Conference in San Francisco, I think it's said 79, and that was about when I first got involved, so that must have been my first experience of Harry. He certainly had a delightful champagne personality, always joking around, always flirting, really a lot of fun guy. Also a contrarian, <laughs> liked to argue the other side. Uh, one time I said to him a fairly high profile California environmentalist that I had made some inroads towards uh, getting this person to have insights and understanding of Henry George. So I thought that connecting with Harry. Uh, so they met up, but I understand Harry spent the whole time trying to convince them that nuclear power was environmentally safe. Uh, that didn't go over too well as a way to build a bridge to the environmental movement. So uh, I, I still found Harry wonderfully delightful, but unfortunately from then on, I never did find a, a very effective way to work with him uh, while I was education director at the Henry George School in uh, Northern California. But, you know, each two to their own, but I think it does speak to the importance of our uh, being able to build effective bridges to uh, many of uh, 
uh, organizations and movements that really uh, could and should be our natural allies. So bless you, Harry. <laughs> so I met Harry in 1964, the year I graduated from San Diego State University and moved back to Los Angeles. And I had a lot of fun with Harry. Um, first of all, just for, for background, I became a Georgist the year before in, in uh, 63 because I was having difficulty in my economics class at San Diego State. And um, I found this sign that said, learn why we should tax land. I was a real estate major, one of the first real estate programs in the United States. And um, I read the sign, I said, these people must be crazy. There was the Henry George School. So I walked in the door to find out what they were doing and they invited me to a class and I took their class. And after taking the class, I was a solid Georgist and changed my whole life, my whole thinking about life. The thing about Harry is that Harry is a Georgist. Uh, he wasn't a land value taxer, he was a Georgist. And he, that's why he would say, you know, it's better to throw the money away that we collect from land rent. Um, the important thing to do is to collect the land rent. What we do with it then is another problem, but let's collect the land rent in order to have equity, in order to have freedom, in order to, to have the everyone partake uh, in the benefits of living in, in the universe. Now I say that Harry was fun because first of all, uh, I, I did take the classes from him, the three classes from him, and then I taught them also one time. But uh, along the way, uh, I, was, I would have oftentimes have lunch with him and talk with him. And he was on the Harry Pine National Radio Program uh, every week. Um, Harry Pine was kind of a, a, a right wing kind of uh, activist speaker that would uh, come up with crazy topics and ask for people to speak. And he would also, also, also often get, uh, he and I, on arguing things with uh, Harry, P Harry Pine. And are, you, are you thinking of Joe Pine? No, I'm thinking of Harry Pine. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, uh, that went on and on. We would go across the street to the university club and that there, uh, argue with the people there. But I think the most fun I had was in 1976, I went to the conference, which was in Montreal, Canada, and um, I had just become the uh, assessor of Southfield, Michigan, just weeks before this conference. And when I got to the conference, the uh, part of the theme was, well, how do we get people's attention? You know, we can't, we have a hard time reaching the media uh, and, and uh, raising attention and so forth. So Harry said, well, you know, we, we have a story right here. We have an expert that's just come from the riots in Detroit. Um, and I thought, well, what's he talking about? He said, it's Ted. He was just there, you know. So he invited all the press in and we had this press conference. And they had asked me about the riots in Detroit. I'd only been in Detroit for a couple of weeks, but at least I was there so I could see that there were riots happening and I do remember the blockades of highways and so forth. So I gave them, I gave them my views about what was happening and it made all the newspapers. And I still have those newspaper clippings. It was Harry's idea simply to take whatever he could to, to make action, to get people's attention. The thing I love the, the most about Harry is that he was a Georgist and he was, he was the Georgist that, uh, that inspired me and, and made, uh, Henry George part of my life and his thinking part of my life. Thank you. One of the things I, I just remembered, I, I did interview Harry uh, over email for a couple, actually it went on intermittently over about six months. I was trying to get him to tell me his full story and uh, he never really finished that. I, I, I'm sorry to say. Um, but he, on land theory, uh, many of you participated in land theory. Harry would, was always putting out these bombs. And uh, in one of them that I, that I found uh, while I was looking up things to say about him, he wrote, 
one uh, something on land theory it says is Ed Dodson a Georgist or a Malthusian? So <laughs> he he was never afraid to 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 take on his friends on any issue and you know, because I had some th said some things about maybe the world's a little overpopulated right now. Um, he he took me on directly about that. And we had quite an exchange. But anyway, uh, that that just points again to, to Harry. Harry, there's no fear in Harry to go anywhere. Um, a little like Dan, I guess. <laughs> if it weren't for the Orthodox, we heretics wouldn't know. And what's our relationship to the Orthodoxy? So I appreciate Harry very much on that stance. Well, Harry is kind yeah. of like the ultimate Orthodox heretic because he he would uh, he behaved like a heretic in that he would uh, say outrageous things, but they were usually outrageous things in on behalf of the Orthodoxy. If we're if we're ready to toast Harry, I, I know he would be upset with me because. I'm toasting him with uh, organic Moroccan mint green tea. And he'd, he'd be appalled. He'd, he would be appalled that this is not a glass of beer. Anathema. <laughs> to Harry. To Harry. Wherever you are. <laughs> I think Mary Rose ha has a photo she'd like to share. Can you? Can you bring that up, Mary Rose? Uh, bring, oh, oh, um, okay. Can you share the screen with me? Uh, yes. There you go. So this is the last photo as a group that we took with Fred, who's here in the center. And this was when Fred was representing Robert Schaffenbach Foundation, who was on the board at the time. When we gave, uh, Schaffenbach gave the gift of the annotated works of Henry George to the San Francisco Public Library History Center. And that was in October, 2019. And uh, that's the last time I saw Fred. Um, Fred, served on so many boards within the Georges movement. He taught in so many uh, schools. And I remember when um, his, his first wife passed away, she used to be the secretary of the Berkeley Fellowship uh, Unitarian Universalist, and he lived next door. Uh, next door. And um, one thing I really appreciated with Fred, I could call him up and just uh, mull things over with him. And he was not judgmental. He was very kind and he listened and he gave some uh, very uh, constructive feedback. And that's what I appreciate about him. He was soft-spoken. I uh, met one of his students via email and who uh, actually saw the exhibition at the library and. Uh, I'm sorry, he uh, lost touch with Fred, so I had to be the bearer of bad news about his passing. So um, I just wanted to share that, and I do need to leave at 5.30, so I just thanks for the opportunity to um, share about Fred. He was uh, our vice president most recently of Common Ground California, and he served in that role for a number of years. So um, I appreciate it, really appreciate his support uh, for our chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Something about, about Fred um, and being soft-spoken. I don't know if people are old enough to remember this. So you, you can look it up on YouTube. There's, there's a guy named Wally Cox. He used to have a character <laughs> called Mr. Peepers. And Fred always remind Fred Fulvery always reminded me of Mr. Peepers, and he he said the most very logical things in a very soft spoken way, and um, and had had um, 
there was there was almost he, he was on Fred was almost a character in the way he's in the way he said things but he said them very well and and uh and Fred is is our probably our most libertarian of the Georges he's the closest to the conventional libertarians and still the most Georgist and that has helped a great deal because the liber you know I, I always say their libertarians went right wing um with Hayek, Rothbard, Rand, and Mises, and are not the libertarians they used to be. And, and um, Fred was very, he was very much in line with those right-wing libertarians on the money issue and had street cred with him on that and street cred with him on a lot of other things. And so they listened to, they, they took him much more seriously than they took anyone else when he talked about the land issue and um that was that was just a really valuable thing about him thank you thank you i i uh, remember him saying regularly usually in writing i i believe uh that it was better to th to collect the land rent and throw it in the sea than not to collect it at all a and are you talking uh, about Fred or Harry? Oh, I'm sorry, Harry. I, I've had that on the brain. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that at some other point. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'd like to say something about uh, Harry. Okay. I mean, I mean you got me <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. about Fred. I was really thinking and feeling appreciation for Fred uh, just uh, yesterday. As I was reading a paper from Yusuf Shabir, who uh, works with the government of Pakistan. And this was a paper that was taking a step towards a land value tax policy for Pakistan. Uh, Yusuf uh, is a vice president of our international and the connection had to Fred. So Fred, uh, had international connections and uh, I don't think I'm fully aware of all that they were, uh, but I appreciate that he did and that he did uh, connect any uh, buddy around the world that he knew that had an interest and maybe he got them interested in land value tax, our international movement. I remember many meetings with Fred uh, when he was on the board of the Henry George School in San Francisco and, and I was working as a on the board, but then also as education director. Uh, one uh, bit of uh, work that Fred did that I really have appreciated over the years is his uh, concepts on geo-confederation. And I think the geo-confederation ideas are really important and they should get out to the peace movement essentially, for example, where there's conflict, like you think of the Middle East, the concept is those three small states of Lebanon, Israel, and Jordan could be, and, and including the, the, the Palestinian area, could be uh, confederated. They would each have their distinct uh, identities, but the uh, Confederation Authority would collect the land rent, thus addressing the land problem that's such a, in any area of conflict, such a problem an authority would collect the land rent and then distribute it back to the people based on the population of the different areas. And he, he had it so balanced that the different uh, people would be able to maintain their own cultural identity with their own distinct school sy systems, for instance. Uh, but that things that were um, of, of common needs for the Federation like security would be efficiently funded by the land rent. I think uh, it's a really advanced I idea. I think it's real important to uh, any peace process that has conflict over land and resources, this confederation idea. If you're not familiar with that with Fred, uh, maybe we could get his writings on geoconfederation out and even have a discussion someday. I'd love to do that. So what a shock that Fred left us so suddenly, uh, really uh, tragic in a way. Um, one can't comprehend how 
a healthy person can uh, can can just trip and end up uh, dead a few days later. It's really tragic for us, but he made a magnificent contribution to the Georges movement. Okay. Thank you. Um, All right. Could, yeah. uh, Nick Tiedemann is going to. Well, could I can I briefly say something that's yes. right on what Alana said? It's it's just an example of Fred's thinking. In if if you had a conflict zone like Israel, um, that each each person would pay his land rent, but he was free to. If you were Muslim, you might choose to send your school taxes to the Muslim school, and if you were Jewish, you could send your school taxes to the Jewish school. And if you were secular, you could send your school taxes to the secular school. So that anything that wasn't coercive, like police, because you can't have like, I'm a Muslim, I can only be policed by the Muslims. Obviously, <laughs> if, you're, if you're violating a, a Jew, you can't have, you can't say, well, I can only be policed by the Muslims or the Jew can't say, no, you have to be policed by the Jews. So he he took the coercive monopolies aside from that and everything else you was funded by was funded by the choice of the taxpayer and and he couched that in the in the idea that that the um, the 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 two major religions was islam and judaism and then there was the secular option i imagine you could have had a christian option or a you know other options in there as well, but it was it was like a really innovative thing. Thanks, Dan. Okay, I'd like to go to Nick Tiedemann. Okay, uh, I didn't know uh, Fred all that well. Uh, I somebody should tell us how he became a Georgist. I don't know that. Uh, I met Fred in January of 1987 when uh, Jeff Smith organized a trip to Nicaragua and I decided that I ought to go on the trip. And so a number of us went to Nicaragua to try to persuade the Sandinistas to become Georgists. While we were there, uh, Fred would uh, lecture the tourists, uh, us, on economics at one point or another. and. Uh, I said to Fred, uh, your understanding of economics is at least as good as the graduate students I encounter. Uh, I really think you ought to get a PhD in economics. And so I uh, pointed him to the program that seemed to me most appropriate for him at George Mason University, where he was indeed accepted with an assistantship so that he could afford to go. And uh, five years later or so, he had his PhD in economics. And I brought him to my university for a semester because somebody had gone on leave and we needed somebody to fill in. And then he got a job at Santa Clara where I believe he taught for the rest of his career. Um, as Alana said, he had this very interesting idea of uh, putting people together. Well, when I heard him give his version of uh, combining Israel and Palestine. It was slightly different than the version that Alana gave. It was that uh, within the combination of uh, the, the Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, there would be uh, a social security system, a system of taking care of citizens, one for the Israelis and one for the Palestinians, but then when it came to things like uh, the sewer system and the post office and things where uh, your ethnicity didn't affect what kind of services you would like, then they would all share the same services. It was a very slight variation on what Alana said. Uh, he also had an idea uh, that he developed of how individual communities could uh, make their own decisions about what kind of services they wanted to offer. Now, this is an idea that is not uh, unfamiliar to economists, but he 
developed in, in more detail than other economists had. Uh, he, as was said, he uh, spoke in a soft voice and said very uh, logical, if somewhat startling things, uh, always very politely. Uh, and uh, so, and he uh, was the treasurer of the Schalkenbach Foundation recently, uh, until he died. And he contributed in many ways to many Georgist organizations. That's what I can tell you from my knowledge of Fred. Thank you. Thank you. May I, may I read a brief excerpt from something that Fred wrote and um, I, as a sort of zine publisher, published in 1985. Please. Um, it was called A Geoist Manifesto. And it kind of <laughs> encapsulates a lot of what we've been saying about Fred's um, a very, um, very libertarian approach. Um, and um, these are just a couple of random quotes. Uh, those who do not want to pay economic rent to the government could simply not be entitled to its services. Any individual landholder or community could secede from the government. What keeps corporations responsive to the stockholders is not the stock owner's ability to vote for the directors but their ability to sell their stock and secede from the company. That gives you a bit of a flavor. Um, I think I first contacted Fred after I read a copy of his early book, The Soul of Liberty. And I must have got it via Lazy Fair Books or um, that's probably where I got it from. They were uh, the main distributors of libertarian literature. And Fred was very much a, a moralist or an ethicist. He was also very big on um, an international language, um, Esperanto. He was, at that time anyway, a proponent of that. Another thing about him that you might not know was he was a naturist or a nudist. And in the 1986 CGO IU conference in Vancouver, he and I, there, there was a, I guess an afternoon where you were on your own. And he had wanted to visit one of the nudist beaches in Vancouver. So he and I went to visit them. We kept our clothes on and we didn't actually find, I don't recall we found anybody um, on the beach. It may have been, it wasn't very sunny weather as I recall, it was very overcast. Um, but Fred's real devotion to liberty um, is kind of revealed in that. And um, so anyway, I've, I've known him for a long time. I've, my experience with him as an RSF um, uh, board member was he was not only the soul of liberty, but the soul of rationality and reconciliation. Um, he was not, his personality did not have a shred of antagonism. At least that's my experience of him. And, so I will miss him very much. Thank you. Any others? Please go ahead, Roy. Thank you. I just wanted to, to speak of the impact uh, just simply from his writings. I, I had seen him in the halls of the 2016 conference and I pointed him out to uh, my wife and said, hey, do you know who that is? <laughs> um, here in my living room, I, I uh, hosted a session on his article, Pure Geoism, which is on earthsharing.ca, which is a wonderful summary of Georgism in general. And then later um, in Orlando uh, with, with another group of about a dozen and a half people, 
read out of read a section where Martin Adams quoted uh, in land. And uh, we were talking specifically about the Palestinian um, Israeli issue. And uh, my uh, part of my heritage through my father's side is I'm, uh, I, I descend from Palestinians. And sitting immediately to my left was a, a woman who um, who's Jewish and who has spent a number of decades living in Israel. And I, I was reading <laughs> um, Fulberry's uh, Fred's, Fred's uh, entry about that. And the woman who is Jewish puts her arm around me and pats me on the shoulder, thanks to Fred, because she's like, one of us. And I think that's the amazing power of his writings. And I, I think that they'll probably live for decades forward because of the power of, of simply the words that have been published. And uh, I also got to, pub I, I too bought this whole liberty and I passed it around to various friends to read. And I, I just want to say thank you all. Thank you. Do any of you have links to things on Fred's website? He, he ha has a website at foldberry.net, but there, it doesn't link to a whole lot of things, but occasionally he'd send out a link to a page there. And if any of you have, have saved those, uh, I'd be grateful to, to know about them. Uh, I found one in an email that listed probably 75 PDFs that he would be happy to send out to people, uh, to anybody who wants one of them. And I'm so sorry I didn't pursue it. So if, if, you, if you have anything like that, um, I, I, I'd welcome it. Okay, uh, uh, there are some hands. Uh, Lee, I believe. Thanks, yeah, I, you know, I only got to meet Fred um, when I became involved with Robert Schockenbach Foundation, but I just remember um, when I, first was uh, learning about Georgism and primarily, you know, teaching myself through internet resources um, that I was exposed to his writing. And there's some other people on, you know, in the session here tonight, like Alana and Dan, who I remember like reading uh, their stuff when I was first getting exposed to this. Um, but I, you know, remember um, reading several, you know, essays many years ago by Fred long before I met him and just how grateful I am to you know him and and sort of the influence that he had in like making this make sense to me and bringing me in um, before I had ever had the pleasure of meeting uh, so many of you um, and uh, you know in the last several years we've been together on the RSF board and have just been very very grateful for his contributions to the board and his service as treasurer over these past couple of years. Um, and uh, uh, just his uh, tremendous commitment uh, to the organization and, and just helping us just get work done when, when it needed to get done um, and really valued his, uh, his reliability and commitment as well. Thank you. Uh, Ed. And unmute myself. I, I, many people may not know this, uh, he was born in Israel, in uh, Haifa, and his family came to the United States, I guess, in 1953 after a year in Guatemala. Um, so I don't know when he first encountered Henry George. Um, maybe maybe uh, someone else does. I, I just have a question. I think and this is correct, that he's the one who coined the term geolibertarianism. So, um, and um, if you want to read, you know, Fred's stuff, I have quite a collection of his writings on on my website under his biographical listing. So you can. Uh, he wrote a lot for Land and Liberty, and there's quite a few articles there that are still, you know, relevant. Uh, you know, aren't time sensitive to read. Good. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, he. Um... He not only wrote, um, or he not only coined geolibertarianism, but he he more recently coined geoanarchism, and he made the case that you could have rent sharing without government, that people could voluntarily recognize that they have an that because they're holding land, they have a moral obligation to to uh, 
do something for the landless, either to pay, you know, give them a share of rent or something. And he, he basically made the case that this could be done entirely without government. So he, um, he um, very much was, was building bridges to that libertarian, even the, the anarcho-capitalists are kind of the extreme branch, and he was even building bridges to them. And a lot of them were responding to it. A lot of, a lot of um, anarcho-capitalists hate government so much that they that they reacted badly to the concept uh, because it was tied to government. And so Fred just cut that tie, and 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 it worked for him. And we have a geo we have a geo libertarian Facebook page, and we. From just just yesterday, got what what's the difference between a Georgist and a geo libertarian? And the usual response is it's just a matter of emphasis, and that we do have we do have Georgists who don't appreciate Georgia's libertarianism as much as other Georgists. So the you know the geo libertarians um, just tend to emphasize that, and and that's kind of inspired me. I I. I start saying, okay, then we have people who are geosocialists, and we have people who are geoliberals, and and we even have Winston Churchill, our, or geo-imperialist, um, because because he he wanted land value tax for the British Isles, and he probably wanted land value tax for other countries, but he he had no compunctions about um, you know the the beneficence of the British Empire justifying domination of of much of the world so so i just said okay then he's our geo-imperialist so you can have you can have many other biases and still be and still be georgist in some ways um i'm sure if if, if he were to confront henry george directly um the george would take him to task for that uh, much as mark twain did but uh but anyhow yeah that that all all those concepts of um, of separating George from or separating Georges who have other beliefs um, of saying, okay, here's how George can be compatible with those other beliefs, and here's where it differs. Uh, Fred was very much a pioneer in that kind of specialized uh, distinguishing. Thank you, Alan. Yes, I, I just wanted to um, share my appreciation for his involvement with this uh, group, the um, uh, Civil Society Institute at Santa Clara University. And this was so well done, I thought, and um, such a wonderful uh, work. It's called The Ultimate Tax Reform, Public Revenue from Land Rent. And the first paragraph starts out with US tax system is widely perceived as too complex too invasive and too demanding of workers' paychecks. Taxes today claim a greater share of the average family budget than food, clothing, housing, and transportation combined. In 2005, the average American had to work 107 days to pay taxes compared to 44 days in 1930. And then he says, uh, if land value is taxed, the land will not flee, shrink, or hide. A tax on land value has no dead weight loss. Anyway, I recently discovered that there's another uh, civil society group in uh, San Diego, and so hopefully they can carry on some of the some of the work and some of this tradition. I feel uh, civil society institute is just what um, American society needs. Thank you. Okay, and and that that document in three different lengths is on the Schockenbach site un, under um, an inter introduction to Henry George. Excellent, thank you. Brian, you're, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Wynne, and I apologize to Sue because I didn't uh, flag that I, I was going to speak. I hadn't intended to, but uh, especially after what Alan has just said, um, touching on dead weight loss, so I think that's an area for us to go into. And uh, uh, like Ted Courtney, I'm a retired real estate assessor. Um, we call them valuers over here in Melbourne. Um, but I thought I'd have a go at assessing what I thought was our dead, dead weight loss on a dynamic basis. And Fred Harrison 
uh, printed that on his website. And over here, uh, what I had done is I included the, um, the losses due to recession as part of the dead weight, which I think is valid. A couple of professors of economics here tell me I can't do that. But on the, uh, as, a, as a, an aside on Fred Sartre, uh, Fred Harrison, that is, uh, Fred Foldery uh, wrote, Brian's technique is quite correct and appropriate. My, I said, yeah, it's, it, you know, because I'm sure it is. And we've actually done another technique altogether that shows dead weight loss to be in the order of twice the amount of tax levy. And if Georges can't make something of that, uh, because there's no dead weight with um, brown red, as we know, uh, but I, I've noticed that, you know, we're poking around saying, oh, it might be about one time the, you know, the amount of tax levy that's lost, or dead weight lost. But um, anyway, I was really heartened um, by, by Fred saying that, that Barnes technique is correct. I met, uh, met Fred when he came out here <coughs> a couple of years, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of years ago, and I took him for a drive around Melbourne. We had lunch together at um, a place over at Williamstown overlooking the beach, and we had a nice chat together. But um, I, my, uh, my knowledge of Fred is very limited, but uh, I certainly en enjoyed his company. And uh, uh, maybe for selfish reasons, also like what he had to say on uh, dead weight loss. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Anyone else? Uh, Mark. If my memory serves me, Fred contributed to a book edited by another Fred, Fred Harrison, called Costing the Earth. And I think Dead Weight Loss was included in that collection of um, essays. It was published by Shepard Walton, if you want to look it up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Polly? Just reminding everybody that Fred wrote a little monograph predicting the crash in, 20, in 20, 2008, and I think predicting another one in 2026. So we've got uh, five years to go. Yeah, I've been posting about that on my uh, web blog, trying to uh, warn people about that and, and going on record so I'll be able to uh, point to what I said when things actually uh, go to pot. <laughs> okay. Another thing that I didn't fully appreciate myself was all the articles that Fred has contributed to progress.org. Um, there may be too much online for any one person to read. Um, but I myself will go back and uh, to the archives of progress.org and see what Fred has posted there. Good, good. All right. Well, to Fred. We miss him. To Fred. 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 A little bit earlier, um, there was talk about a conference at Berea, at, and I, that sounded familiar to me, and I dug into my files, and I've got a photo that was taken uh, of uh, what I, are supposed to be all the attendees, and I'm not seeing Harry there, but let me see if, uh, I'm not, not real good at sharing the screens, but let me see if I can, can yes, there it is. Oops, that's not what I, uh, are you seeing my screen? Are you seeing a, a photo, group photo? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, the, the, I, I recognize about five faces there. Uh, I need some confirmation from Nick on one of them. But front and center, uh, the man with the vest uh, on the left, I believe is John C. Lincoln. That's correct. And is, is that John? Joe Thompson Monroe? is the guy next to him. Pretty Who sure. That? I think it's uh, Joseph Thompson. Ah, okay. The industrial electrical electrical electric company. Well, a, a P and P uh, version 
more progress, less poverty. Thank you. I'm sorry, they are our vested interests. Oh, no mm. way. Um, my three Georgia's grandparents are, are up uh, toward the top of the, that picture. Um, my, my grandfather, Weld Carter, is a third from left uh, in the next to the back row with, with the striped necktie. My grandmother is the woman with braids to his right. And my step-grandmother uh, is the woman right in front of him. And I believe that her first husband is next to my grandmother uh, over just about in the center, dark hair. But I'm not seeing Harry Pollard, anybody that I could identify as Harry there. Can I say that um, this is not Harry, but Bob Clancy is front row, second from the left. Ah, okay, thank you. Thank what you. year was this? 1955. And it was at Berea College in Kentucky. Hmm. I, th I think uh, there's uh, one of the Tiedemans yeah. in the second to the last row. Yeah, that looks like, looks like my father there, yes. Yes. Where, uh, second from the left and the second to the last row. Second from left? Yes. Okay, so he's next to my, 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 my grandfather's the third from yes. the left. Okay. Okay. Well, um, hmm. interesting to see as many women there. There's Neva Bianco. Mm -hmm. Where? About the middle, right behind uh, um, the former project Thompson, two rows up, and that Neva <clears throat> Bianco? Okay. Like to take Thompson and then go up. There's another woman and then behind her. Okay, uh, so blonde hair, probably. Oh, yeah, with a flowery with dress. Not real long hair, but longer hair. Hair on uh, her sides. I think I may have found Harry. If you go to John C. Lincoln and go up two faces. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Good find there, Mark. Thank you. Who? Who's that? That's Harry. Oh, huh. oh yeah, sure. He, you can't see his beard, wasn't he? <laughs> his beard is behind somebody's head. You, 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 you always look for Harry by his beard. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and uh, Nick, can you is that is that John Monroe second from right at the, at the front? Very likely, yes. Okay. All right. Oh, let me stop sharing. We figure out how to do that. There is a toast that that uh, has, has every year I can remember been delivered by Nicholas Rosen in the in the course of our toast our toasting. And I think we're about ready to wind up. But, but Nicholas, would you do that? If I can remember, I wasn't quite ready, but. Here we go. To those who, seeing the vice and misery that spring from the present unequal distribution of wealth and privilege, feel the possibility of a higher social condition and would strive for its attainment. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. Thank you. Here, here. That doesn't mean we need to stop, but I wanted to be sure that while we were still gathered, I'd, we had that. I'd like to just end the session by uh, uh, thanking those who have contributed uh, to the Council of Georgia's organizations, and also tell you that we do have some sessions coming up. And I, I'd like to just show you a few of the sessions so you, you get an idea and you can make notes and you can find out um, that's the right one, here it is. <laughs> uh, Ted, while you're doing that, uh, on my mind, since we've been airing our libertarian and anarchist linen, I want to thank Nicholas Tiedemann for a very early influence on me. I went to the School of Living that was being led by Mildred Loomis one summer afternoon in Maryland. And Nick presented a paper 
on his sort of Tolstoyan take on Georgism, um, uh, using the term single tax anarchism. And that must have been in the 1970s. And that's when I first met Nick and um, first felt, well, I guess I'm in good company. I remember the event. Thank you. So when I did, uh, Ted, um, the oral histories links you put up on screen, if you can also paste them in the chat, then anybody can just click on them in chat and they will get them immediately. Okay. Uh, and, the, and we'll also have these on our, on our website. Let me just run through our, our, our courses that are coming up. First, we have our monthly brainstorming session on Thursday, July 22nd. Second, we have our the Henry George Institute meeting is coming up uh, on um, Saturday, July 20, uh, I can't see the- 4th, 24th. 24th, okay. Um, I think the intention is non-members are welcome to sit in. Okay. And we hope some will join. Then, and then for our, our next webinar, the August webinar, is going to be um, <laughs> Eric Stage Horn, who is going to be talking about uh, recapturing uh, revenue from rail improvements and um, and infrastructure investment that we are making in California. I'm going to be giving a series of lectures at the Henry George School the first Monday of of, of August uh, of each of the sessions on land assessment. And Alana is going to be giving sessions on Wednesdays, starting with August 28th and then through, or sorry, July 28th and then through August. Thanks go to our sponsors. All the people listed here have contributed money so that we have these, the, we have the ability to go ahead with these uh, seminars. The officers of the CGO are shown here. And here's the members of the Council of Georgia's organizations, organization members, and second at-large members. So that's basically, and do visit our website. Um, it's uh, cgocouncil.org. And there's, it's, been, it's been totally revamped. It looks really good. And take your time to go and see it. I think I'm going to end it there. There's, uh, I, I have other slides that I'll show you at other events. So thank you all for attending. And uh, I think it's been a wonderful session. And I thank uh, uh, the work that uh, Wynn has put into it and the, the speakers have all put into it. Thank you all for attending. Have a good evening. Thank you. Final thank, you. To Hi. thank you. Thank you.